The opinions expressed in the following podcast are for general informational purposes only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual or on any specific security or investment product. It is only intended to provide education and entertainment about the financial industry and the stock market. Enjoy. On this episode of Pennies Going In Raw, we discuss Bitcoin and sympathies, knowing if a sympathy has become dissociated from the sector, and then some swing talks. You find out life's this game of pennies. Oh, you guys know we only have a 40% runner. Hello? 40% right is a fucking killing. We've been compliant for too long. It's time we go to war. I don't have a Roth. Q knows so much about the market that his brain doesn't have enough room for grammar. Hey, who told me about IDEX? It's going up a shit ton now. Rob, 4%, baby. No way. 4 fucking percent. You asked the exact same question with two words <laughs> different. It's like, fuck, man. I just got dick whipped for like... 20%, and now that f***er's up like 50. I bet Warren Buffett never did that. I'm just making this voice memo to call out unusual whales to a fight. The pennies we need are everywhere, everywhere around us. Pennies, pennies, pennies. Going in raw. Featuring Dan, Deity of Dips, and Hugh Honey. Produced by Vinny and Christian. Let's, Let's go, go, baby. Welcome back to another episode of Pennies Going In Raw. Today is Wednesday, October the 20th, and I mean, we're recording this Tuesday, and, and towards the end of the day, was this like short squeeze mania? We saw like the clove, we saw weed popping, we saw Wish go from 490 to 550. It was like bag holders rejoice. Uh, you saw all these stocks, all these random SPACs, and just all sorts of shit just popping on the end of Tuesday. Uh, is it back to the the retail traders or could be in control? Yeah, so right now it right now I don't want to get too optimistic because it is only like the first move, if you will. And what we talked about like two weeks ago was how like weed never really hasn't really been holding up. Uh, like the first few moves and we had like really haven't been holding up. Today's action though was definitely different. Like it like it just felt different. Um, it wasn't like a 2% pop. I mean, Tilray went from under $10 and closed at above 1150, you know? So, so I think the biggest thing will be, let's see what the rest of the week brings as far as like weed and other sectors, because we talked about it. it's, it's, I hate those like pop and drop plays. It's the ones where they pop, come down, hold, support builds, and then they make that secondary move. That's the real move is going to be that secondary move. And also it gives, you know, a chance to collect a lot of shorts, you know, because the shorts have been comfortable. It's been a pop, short, drop market. So if we can get into like a pop, drop, hold, and uh, consolidate and then make the second move, that's when that's when, you know, the real moves will happen. And that's when, you know, retail really can make the solid plays. When you think about on like, uh, since you've been doing this for a while, how long until that second move usually happens? Can it be as quick as by the end of this week or should it be something yeah. we just look for the rest of this week? We just wait and see if these prices hold or should we be looking for something just sooner than that? Yeah, so it, it, when we look at like key levels, key support and resistance, what we want to see really is the old resistance become new support. So let's call it, um, you know, 1150 on Tilray. If we wake up tomorrow and it flushes underneath that and then it comes back and makes its way above that again and it holds there, that's what we would consider starting the second move. It's kind of hanging around those highs. It's still up 15% on the week. And then when it gets a little bit of volume and it curls around, that's when it makes that second move. So most of the time I'd like to see it within the, within the you know second or third day of so of that pop so today today we're recording this on tuesday i'd like to see by thursday afternoon it kind of make that that new high over you know 12 or something um because that's when the momentum's still there so even if it's lower volume like a lower volume pullback i'd like to see it regain and that because that still makes the play uh you know makes the move in play and what do you think caused a lot of this? I mean, obviously you saw like Bitcoin hit like 
crazy prices for what seems like the first time in months. Those sympathies started to hit. And just is it just like I said, again, is retail like finally in control where these stocks are going and it's, you know. Yeah, no, it's definitely good to th see on some of those SPACs and like the wish wish plays. I think it right now it's kind of just um, what, what ends up happening is that some volume comes in and then uh, the shorts that, you know, have had such an easy ride just end up saying, ah, screw it. And they end up covering this kind of creates more of like a more of like a supply and demand squeeze kind of thing, like a small squeeze. But again, if tomorrow, if wish is back below sub five, then it's like the move never happened. It doesn't really matter. Now, if wish holds over like 525 and, you know, maybe Wednesday or Thursday sees 575. Now it's one of those. OK, maybe bottom really is in play and we can start to look for a confirmation of a curl on the larger time frames to where we can scale in similar to what we talked about with any when any went from like five dollars to like 150 and then it broke that massive downtrend similar to that maybe we can look for a bigger break and kind of like a scale in uh bigger conviction trade for, from the long side so i know like it used to be like bitcoin was kind of it almost would run opposite of SPY sometimes, and then it kind of got into this rhythm where it kind of ran with it. And then, you know, it, it almost started to be like the mid cap and the retail traded stocks were the ones that kind of ran with Bitcoin, whether it be just because institutions aren't really 100% sure about it yet or whatever it may be. Do you kind of see any correlation with the change of Bitcoin and then what it runs with as a, aside from just its sympathies about like Coinbase, et cetera? Um, I think it depends sometimes on what the news is, because a lot of times when when we talk about Bitcoin, uh, let's say the government talks about Bitcoin, they'll also talk about other issues. So sometimes like uh, things can be correlated, similar to like sometimes the Bitcoins and the memes will run. Um, so it's kind of more like what's inside the headlines with it. But Bitcoin has so many things that run with it that it, it's almost too much at this point. I even tweeted about it today and I think I was talking about the basket and, uh, and one of the questions that I got today was, you know, like, why did I grab, uh, I grabbed FTFT, BTBT and like SOS and why didn't I grab the other ones that, that I also mentioned? And part of that is because of relative strength versus relative weakness. Like CAN was already up 11% and FTFT was only up 2%. So I felt that that had relative weakness and if it only caught up to where CAN was, then we would be up 9%, you know, something along those lines. So those are the reasons that, you know, it's important to have the basket and also know the basket and know, okay, can usually goes first because it's one of the lowest floats. And then uh, SOS, if SOS goes, then it's likely that all of them go. So it, it's important to understand which ones go inside what baskets and why. Um, and then, and then it comes down to, you know, so FTFT went, but uh, SOS didn't. So I got stopped out of SOS for like a small loss, but then FTFT ended up going like seven, eight percent. Yeah. And kind of one of the last things I want to talk about for, you know, what happened at the end of day Tuesday. And, and it kind of touches on what you said on if, if Wish does just go back to five, it's almost like it never happens in the past. So like what, four or five times it's tried to break out of that five range, gets up to 520 always comes back down so and i i definitely was not afraid to scale some but kept some in case it did want to confirm that reversal i think that's kind of be a, been a big trend and uh in fintwit recently is just letting people know taking profits taking profits taking profits yeah yeah definitely and, and it sucks because um it because well it, it, it was so awesome to see the market the last 16 months, but at the same time, it creates so many bad habits uh, similar to like, hey, I can just continue to hold this and it's going to moon a thousand percent. And I mean, uh, that's that's just not the reality. And uh, so, it, so it is good to see like kind of Fintwit just preaching like this, take profits, take profits, because uh, because we're not inside the market where you can just hold and, and it'll be higher no matter what. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to like when the market, even just last year, I mean, you saw SPAQ go to Fisker and I mean, it did not look like it was ready to reverse and eventually it just did. And I think that was one of those things I saw a lot of people and I didn't quite understand it at the time were saying stuff like, you know, I wish it didn't reverse so these people would kind of get a lesson. I think Wish probably uh, taught them that little lesson. Yeah, 
Yeah, hopefully. You know, it, 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 it comes down to it, you can go two ways on this. You can either learn, never do it again, or do it again but still have better risk management. Um, or you continue to do this and you'll blow up your account. Like it, it kind of comes down to being that simple. Yeah. And I know a big thing, you know, especially with Bitcoin and everything, we always talk about sympathies. Uh, sometimes there's always that thing where it's like, you know, this sympathy is lagging behind the rest. I'm going to get this one. This one seems like the one, all the rest are up 10%. This one's up 2%. You just mentioned it earlier on one of your Bitcoin sympathies. Uh, is there ever a time when you can say, hey, this is lagging, but then realize, you know, maybe it's not lagging and it's just associated from the sector entirely? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that, that's what we were talking about earlier. Like SOS really didn't move. Um, it really didn't move all day with Bitcoin, you know, breaking new highs. And so that's where it comes down to, you know, not putting all your eggs in the one basket, but maybe taking like 30% of your portfolio and scattering it around the basket. Um, you know, sometimes there's Sometimes you just have stocks that you know inside the basket trade better than others. And, uh, or, or like I said, for instance, like SOS, I wasn't exactly sure if it was going to go, but I know that when it goes, it goes. Um, I'm just, I'm just not sure if it's going to go. So it's a higher risk to reward. So I, I would put less into it than I would, I would like an FTFT. Um, or like I usually like to trade a uh, can. But CAN was already up 11%. So if I wanted to take a nibble, it would just be less. But to your point about the disconnect, 100%. And that's why it's important to kind of scatter around your basket because you really don't know which ones the algos are going to pick up. Like, for instance, if... Um, if if Bitcoin's going based on you know just mining and stuff, then it's not going to pick up some of the Chinese you know some mining in the United States. Then it's not going to pick up like the SOS, like the Chinese miners, and and that's okay. That's why it's important to sprinkle around the basket, have good risk management, good risk reward. So I lost like one percent on SOS, but um like I said, FTFT I made like seven or eight. So like that's the kind of risk reward to have. And one thing we do want to start doing a little more is talking about like our trades and our plans and and how exactly did you manage that SOS trade where you only lost 1%? Yeah, you were watching the others, but was there other risk management in play than just, hey, I'll watch the others, see what they do? Or do you like how many like aspects of it go into that? Yeah, no, I mean, tons goes into it, uh, you know, charting key levels based on the specific stocks, um, you know, is really important. And then the other thing that's important is that, you know, having so most of the time we talk about inside a sector having up the main runner. Bitcoin's a little different because you got to have a Bitcoin you got to have uh you got to have a bitcoin you got to have up like the main runner. So I had up so I actually had up like seven or eight different Bitcoin tickers. And uh, the ones I was watching the most were the ones that were up the most, you know, specifically CAN. Um, but then I also had up all the rest just to kind of see what was happening because what, what ends up happening is that the algos move around the basket. So first they'll go to CAN and then they'll go to EQOS, stuff like that. So I'm hoping most of the time to be in before the algos hit it, which is why I didn't take CAN because CAN was already up 11%. But FTFT gave me the good risk to reward because... Um, because uh, algos came in and lifted that seven eight percent, so it's stuff like that where you know as long as as long as you keep tight risk management and like if Bitcoin had began to sold off, I would have just sold them all. Um, but so I said, okay, let me see which ones it's hitting. As it gets closer to the end of the day, I stop adding to the basket, and then uh, then it comes down to like okay, like algos aren't going to hit SOS today. Fine, I stop out for a one two percent three percent loss, um, no more than three percent. And then uh, to the long side, you know, I'm looking for those pops depending on, again, key levels and what every other Bitcoin uh, sympathy is up. So obviously, like swings haven't been the hottest the past few months. And, and you were kind of vocal about going with the whole day trader hue thing. Are these some of the things you learned in the past few months or? I mean, or. Yeah, because it's just I know you have been day trading more, and I know when you're day trading, you got to be watching hella things. So, uh, you know, it's just like the, just refining your tools. Yeah, no, exactly. No, it, it's definitely about refining tools, and it, and the thing is that I, I feel like I 
uh, like I understand day trading well. I'm just not great at like the risk management. I get tired and the tire comes from the heart condition. So that's more of like a personal thing. That's not really like a, like I can't day trade. Uh, it more if comes if down you to, are a PGR listener with a heart condition, I'm sure this is a very, you know, you can relate here. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like that's really what it comes down to is that like, man, 2 p.m. I mean, I'm I'm toast most of the time, uh, you know, from from day trading, just from just from looking at everything. And I hate like those days where nothing works and you and you take like seven or eight losses. I hate that shit. Um, so the good days like when sympathies run and baskets run like those are my kind of days. Um, but it, so, so it really comes down to, yeah, what, what you were saying about refining the refining for sure. And right now it's more about like, uh, really, I just try and I call it, keep the lights on, make a few dollars on the, on the account. So I'm not just, you know, flatlined, um, or, or when the days that the swings are down, just trying to make enough to, to kind of comfort the unrealized. Um, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. And I think one, one big thing to talk about especially with it coming back to a point where people are super excited about swings being brought back and things are bottomed out and and we've seen some some glimpses we saw cei go from 50 cents to five dollars we saw dats go from what was like three dollars or like eight dollars something crazy to like 17. um but then they they followed up yeah massive gains but they dropped massive and starting to bounce again is that something you'd worry about as a swinger? Obviously, you know, from a more experienced standpoint, having your stock up two to 500% is never a bad time. But is this something you'd be like, hey, you know, new guys, watch out. You are seeing this action where up big, down big, you know? Uh, so obviously scale out, scale out, scale out. But does that kind of give you any any worries or what insight do you have on like those moves where it's like just one swing people are on and like let's say people are on f cell right now and let's say it hits 12 by the end of the week should you know is that something they should expect uh yeah i mean the one thing that i would definitely say is that these moves that are retail crowded are uh are, are super fluid so what i mean by that is that when it dips you know, you'll see similar to CEI, you'll see a dollar dip. When it rips, it rips. You'll see a dollar fifty rip. You know, similar to FCEO. FCEO went from eight ninety to uh I mean basically eight under eight ten uh in, in a matter of like fifteen minutes. And then another fifteen minutes later, it was back up to eight seventy eight. Like those are really fluid dollar moves. I mean, that's a ten percent move. So the biggest thing is that understanding that is that hey there's really good uh liquidity out there and there's really fluid moves and really good opportunity so if you had held that a you know let's just say that you had shorted 880 and you had covered at 810 that's a really good move but if you had just held it for another 15 minutes you'd now be down on this on the short so you'd be up go from up 10 percent to basically break even or yeah, down it's a, it's a day trader's dream mm -hmm. and, a, and a panic seller's worst nightmare exactly exactly fomo and panic are are i mean it, they're all over the place so that being said and knowing that is that if you are inside these stocks trading around the core is essential is essential um one of the things that i try and do is is that um you know if i was trading something like that on days where it's up three, if it's up four or five percent or more, I'll cut fifty percent of my position. On days where it's down four or five percent, I'll add back fifty percent of the fifty percent. And that's like that's a way where okay, if I'm if I can't be at the computer all day every day, knowing the fluidity of these moves is really important because today. When it was down 5%, I would have added 50% of my position. And then when it retraced and went up 5%, I would have cut that. So that's a 10%, like that's an easy move. Um, and I would have been in and out today. Um, and it give and it and you don't need to be there at the computer all day, you know. Like well, like if you're like a security guard or you're a mechanic, you know, it's something where you can just put bids out, put sales out, and you're there. You know, like don't try and make like a 20% move. Just take like a five, six, seven, eight percent move. You do that four times, that's a 30% move overall.
Yeah, and even if you are like under PDT or on margin or something, these swings that are moving up in the day, you can sell them and then buy it back. It's not giving you a day trade as long as you didn't buy it that same day. So, I mean, you can be scaling out if you're under PDT and you're not on a cash account as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that that's really super important because one of the worst things that you can do is uh, is I mean on those on those days where it goes down ten percent is to then panic sell and then when it's up ten percent you know rebuy so it's one of those things where yeah you know it's one of those things that to combat that have a really solid plan you know if it gets to set eight twenty I'm adding if it gets to eight eighty I'm selling you know and just trading that range really well and always keeping a core position if you have on eighty thousand shares of something. And uh, you know, trade around sixty thousand and just hold twenty thousand. Like that's the way to do it. That's the way that you can keep a really good risk management. Always have some on, you know, just because because overall you are long the stock. You can always have on a, a chunk of size, but then uh, you know you can trade around and make a really good dollar in between. Yeah, and we always talk about trading around your position to kind of build up a cushion. But one thing we never really have mentioned is that. Sometimes it doesn't build a cushion. Sometimes it can really screw you over. And now you're just, if you're consistently trading around your position, but always selling because you think it's going to break down and then buying, you know, oh God, it's under five again. I'm selling. Oh God, you know, it's, it may yeah. break out of this 520. I'm fine. I'm buying it back. You're essentially just losing 4% every trade. And it's just, yeah. you, you know, it's, you've got to finally get that consistency, consistency. And that's why we always talk about the support and resistance because there's really nothing scarier than, uh, you know, always selling at the bottom and buying the top. And uh, do you know it's a little spookier than buying buying the top and selling the bottom? No, what? Uh, it's shaving your balls with anything other than <laughs> Manscaped. When it comes to below the waist grooming, there's no need to carve pumpkins this Halloween because Manscaped is here to upgrade your grooming experience. Go from a bite-sized candy bar to a king-sized candy bar and join the 2 million worldwide by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping using the code PGIR. Now listen guys, they have everything you need from the boxers to the to the travel bag, to the weed whacker, to the nose trimmer. It, it's got it all. I, I don't trim with anything other than it. The only thing I trim without it is my stocks because it doesn't work on TD Ameritrade. So make sure you go to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the code PGIR. Um, so one thing you've been tweeting about a good bit for you know one of your swings, and it's had it's had good days as well, is uh, BCTX. Uh, we haven't done a Hughes DD of the week in a while. Um, is there is there something you want to go over with on that one that makes you bullish and holding? Well, I think the first thing that I really like about this BCTX, and you know, like we talked about, I do have a position, is that I actually it came to my, it came close to my stop, like uh, it came close to my stop loss uh, two or three times actually when it was sitting at seven. But um, the one thing that I always try and, and, and do is and that one before just before you kind of yeah. go, that, if something is consistently hitting your stop loss and not exactly doing it, does that mean it's just repeatedly bouncing off support because that's where you keep your stop loss? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I keep, uh, um, I keep uh, a stop loss like pretty much underneath support, but not directly under. I keep it a good amount under, and and the reason why is so. For instance, BCTX support was like right at seven. It hit six ninety like two or three times, and the reason. Um, that I didn't get stopped out, even though the support is at seven, is because market makers like to market makers a lot of times like to bring them just underneath those you know levels that they know are support. For instance, seven. Um, and in doing so, I knew that if I, I I knew that if they had brought it just under seven, I didn't want to get stopped out because I, it is a higher conviction trade for me. So. Um, I had kept, you know, so I kept my stop loss like uh, I believe like six, uh, six seventy five or something, and it didn't, it didn't come close to that. So, um, you know, that being said, it hit nine fifty nine, failed to break out, came back down to seven. Uh, seven is holding beautifully. So the one thing that I always try and do is that on my high conviction swings is that I always try and add, add, add until it hits my, until it hits my swing. So if it comes back up, confirms. 
uh, or tries to confirm and it doesn't confirm a breakout, I still add even if it fails and comes close to the to to my um, support. I mean to to my stop loss. And the reason I do that is because again, it is a high conviction swing, and I knew that if it had come all the way down there and I didn't add and it and it goes back up to that nine spot, I'll be mad at myself for not for not adding. So um, so it came back up. Because essentially, you'd the, be just having very small profits or breaking even as opposed yep. to potentially having a, a massive gain. Exactly, exactly. And so because it had come really within like a few percentage points of my stop loss, it, even if it hit my stop loss, it would only be a little bit of a larger loss. But if it had broken back out over that 10 or, you know, 959, then the, the gain would have been worth it. The gain would have been like a 15% gain more. So I felt like a pretty good risk reward there. It actually came up and tested that 850 resistance zone. And now we're kind of cupping, cupping and handling a little bit sitting at this 784. So I, the next point will be to retest that 850. And I'd like to see to see it get through there. Um, as far as catalysts go, you know, the catalysts are still on par. The thing that I find really interesting, I is think that we're seeing it, a change in you, man, you go from only fundamental analysis to introducing yeah. it with technicals i mean i know i know well that was the thing was that was that i mean realistically what i should have done is that i should take him more off at 950 but uh, i really didn't take any shares off so i, I was kind of pissed at myself for not trading I, you know we talk about trading around the course so much but when it I, I was i was gonna i was waiting for closer to 10 to trim a lot but uh you know it came that 959 spot and i really didn't trim any so i was kind of mad at myself um, but then it was sitting at seven so fast. Like it had taken like a 25% dip in, in almost a week. And, and, and I was like, man, like, you know, the, at this point, it's at this point, we need the chart to kind of turn around before I can add any, you know? So, so that's why I'm leading with that. Cause that's really was important. I mean, it, it was minus 25% in like four or five days, but I mean, I, I had like, like my Roth was adding at like the sevens. Like, I mean, I mean, right now, if we're over nine within the next two or three weeks, then uh, I'm going to look like a genius because literally seven, I, I just had these massive bids that, that were just getting filled on, you know? So it was, it was, it's, it's actually worked out inside my favor, but uh, I, if I could redo it, I would have cut more at that 950 spot. Was it tough whenever, I mean, you, you mentioned it dipping. I mean, you say the number 960 basically, and now seven. I mean, that's that's such a massive dip. Like, how fast did that happen? And how worrisome was it? And like, what did you do to kind of convince yourself, hey, no, this is still good. I still should be in this. I need to ha have conviction. Yeah, I mean, within, uh, what is this? Within four trading days of hitting 950, it was at that seven level. So it, it happened pretty quick. And the thing is that- um, Because downtrends can be scary, man. Oh my God, yeah. Especially this, for, I'm looking on the daily chart. This first candle took it from uh, 940 all the way down to seven, 776. Like that was, that day I was like, Oh, holy hell what like I, I literally remember sitting here like this is ridiculous like we just flushed through like so many technicals um but the biggest thing is that i have to say is that you know am i mad that i didn't cut any yes but am, do, is it because i feel that it's overvalued at nine no no i don't the market cap was uh, is still like 109 million I mean, it's got competitors who I wouldn't even touch at uh, 1.4 billion, and this is a tenth of that size. So even though they are early, I like the oh, I like the company overall. I they're trading at 109 million. Uh, the cash, the position that they have is 55 million. Like those two things alone, um, you know, make me really convinced that this is still undervalued. You know, it's trading at about cash per share is about you know 450 per share or something like that. Um, and the thing is that every day we're just seeing more and more um you know 13 f's file which gives me even more conviction you know like there's like people loading this up um down uh, even even though it's up here so those are the reasons i like it the catalyst as far as like the buyback goes i thought the buyback was going to do a little bit more and i and i even i even uh I was even criti I even criticized the company when they did that Benzinga conference or whatever because I said why the hell would they take on this conference if they weren't going to release any news? Like I, I was pretty 
I was pretty worked up about it. Um, like they made a big deal out of going to this conference and they said the same thing that we already knew. Um, so I, I really didn't love that as far as the company, but it wasn't something where I was like, okay, like it, like it wasn't like a TRCH where I got like this icky feeling inside my stomach. So I held on to it. And like I said, it sold off. I kept adding at seven. It tried to break out over that 850, which is a pretty big resistance zone. And it failed that. And now we're kind of chilling between the 780 to 850 kind of range. And and until and I'm fine consolidating here until we make the next big move up on news or something. So someone that's been listening to the podcast for a while obviously knows at least a general idea of how you find your stocks, your big cash on hand kind of guy, et cetera, et cetera. And anyone that's been trading for, you know, the, our, the stocks that, you know, the small mid caps for a while knows about BCTX. Did you just have this on your radar for a while waiting for it to get into a certain price range? Or was there news or something that gave you the idea, hey, I like this, the catalyst it has coming up. Why, why did you randomly decide BCTX? Oh, so I was in BCTX um, like six or seven months ago um, when it was inside like the threes. And and I cut it rather soon. Same with the warrants. I had uh, like 200,000 warrants at um at like $1.60. They're now trading at like $4.50. Um, like, like, they're, like this thing, like don't get me wrong, this thing has moved, but um, there's one stock that kind of, that this kind of reminds me of, and that's GoGo, G-O-G-O. And I had originally looked at GoGo -Go last year when it was sub a dollar. Like literally, like this thing was sub a dollar. And if you guys follow GoGo -Go at, at, at all, you guys know that it's, it, it hit $20 per share. Um, so <laughs> that was the one time where I had said, okay, yeah. yeah. I, so I looked at GoGo -Go at 240 last year and I decided not to pull the trigger on it because it was sitting at it, cause it was sitting at 240 and the low was like a sub a dollar or something. So I never pulled the trigger on it. And um, even though I felt like it was still undervalued and I mean, it's hit $20 per share. So that was one of those ones where I was like, okay, I need to start, even though I like only bottom, even though I like things that are bottomed out and even though I like things to be, you know, super, like I always talk about like overdone, like super oversold, you know, similar to like where Wish is. I felt like GoGo -Go was the one where I had, where even though it was up, I knew how undervalued it still was and I didn't take the position and the position went a thousand percent in a year. So it's one of those times where I think that kind of took me to a different level as a swing trader because it said to me, okay, hey, listen, even though it's undervalued and you didn't have it at its low, um, you know, you can still, you can still take this position. You know what I mean? Like, it sounds super simple, like, duh, like you knew that this was undervalued. You knew that this should be double digits, but, um, but you didn't take the position and you missed out. So I didn't want the same thing to happen with BCTX. So you got to have your way with the stock after it had its way with you. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I, so, I mean, it was, it was frustrating, you know, like it was frustrating. It, it was just one of those times where I was like, okay, this, I'm not going to let this be another go, go, you know? All right. Well, I think that may cover it for this Wednesday's episode. We've seen some bullish signs in today's market. Whether it be bullish or Wall Street bets fucking with us. I mean, SPY's back at 450. Uh, 480 or 500 by the end of the year. What are we looking at, man? Ooh, 480 or 500. Yeah, yeah. Because the thing is that I really wasn't expecting this big of a, this big of a retrace this fast. I mean, we... Yeah, we talked about it on Sunday or what was it like last Wednesday? We were talking about like, oh yeah, like Spy maybe sees 420. It was at 430. It's now at 450 again. Like, what is this? Like, this is, it, I mean, it's seriously crazy. Um, like even even we had talked about how how I thought new highs were coming by the end of September, or whatever. Like we're really not that far off, and I and that was like eight percent ago. So yeah, like I really you were so wrong on the September prediction. Now two weeks later, it's like damn, it's pretty fucking close now. <laughs> yeah, like if this was two weeks ago, like I'd yeah, be, you'd be a I'd genius. Be, yeah, exactly. Which and honestly, and then Wednesday, I'm saying like oh yeah, like four twenty at least. You know. So listen, this is incredible. It's it's awesome to see. Um, it just goes back to this market is so resilient. I mean, the VIX was at t was going for thirty. It's now back at fifteen. I can't believe that. Um, it, it's it's awesome to see, but it's also like wow. If you get caught on the wrong side of some of these moves, I mean, you can. I mean, there there was some 
there are some big hedge funds that could that could be smoked, let alone retail. Um, but I do think that I, I just I just don't think that you can bet the under on the market anymore after these last sixteen months. Sixteen months. So I think uh, five hundred by the end of the year is not crazy. All right, well, guys, um, to kind of wrap this up, uh, I think we could kind of do like a little mini giveaway. Uh, we have something cool coming up. We got our little comfy collection of PGR gear. Finally, the hoodies. There's been like ho hoodie shortages everywhere. We got sweatshirts, maybe some sweats. And uh, I think maybe something, something we really appreciate from y'all is if you give us a five star or subscribe and like our YouTube channels, it takes just a second that helps us out a ton more than you can imagine. Uh, and, and we also got the NBA season coming up, but also we're in the middle of the NFL season. So make sure to leave us a five star, say what you like about the podcast in a five star review. And then end it with, uh, you know, an NFL team or NBA team you like to go the whole year or just your favorite one and uh, leave your Twitter handle in it. And we'll uh, we'll give out three. Oh. What? Dude, shout out to our boy uh, Grayson. Oh, yeah. Uh, Grayson. Well, I think he's underpaid, man. I think two years, 20 million isn't enough for him. He's a sniper. He shot like 40 percent from million? three. Jesus. For two years, dude. Come on, man. So ten million, dude. That's uh, that's ten thousand a day. Hey, Grayson, baby, good job. I mean, ten thousand a day. Uh, I think to play it's basketball. I, no, no, it's way more than that. Cause five thousand a day on a two hundred day trading schedule, and I know it's different for basketball players. Is a million. So I think that no, be that's what, four thousand, isn't it? Okay, so it'd be forty thousand dollars a day. No, four thousand a day is a million. Yeah, so, so forty thousand would be ten million. Oh, he's making wait. He's making every how much? every trading day. Every trading wait. He's, day, he's making, making twenty. 40 racks. Wait, he's making ten 40 million racks. this year. He's making t twenty million to your contract. I'm pretty sure. Oh my! If I'm God. shooting forty percent from three, dude, I'm on thirty. <laughs> God. That, well, hang on. So every so hang on a minute. NBA every players day, get a bag. Grayson's man. just sitting up. And ah, I'm forty thousand dollars richer. Damn, Grayson. Yo, put all right. Listen, hit me up. Nah, dude, we we're gonna put talk, this all inside the trading account. <laughs> yeah, we're, this we're putting it all inside the trading account. We're taking it to a billy by the end of uh by the end of the 2020 uh 2020 yeah, decade. Yeah, stop stop with the fucking NFTs, Grayson. Let's let's get into some yeah. small caps, man. <laughs> yeah, dude, you can buy missile, <laughs> <laughs> dude. Dude, every time you see that 4K camera in an NFL game, man, do you not just like, damn, this, how is Vistle this low? Dude, I want to <laughs> yell at the camera guy. I'm like, <laughs> I was, oh my God, dude, dude. Vistle should have a like a watermark every time it goes honestly, on the NFL, like V-I-S-L. <laughs> honestly, sometimes it's like some of these companies where like I truly am like, you're like two or three people away from like, you know, like becoming a real company. You, like put, if you, could you put Vistle in porn production? <laughs> And you tell me oh, that God. stock's not $75 by the end of the year. Dude, anytime you see that fucking 80K shit and where you see Tom Brady's, like, the lips of Tom Brady's son, like, on on his cheek or, like, right by his... That's this <laughs> one. That's that camera, man. Dude, I literally... Listen, uh, there's some times where it's like... I wish I could just put my name into the into the hat for like CEO of some of these companies because they have they're legitimate companies like they have real revenues. It's like, hey, cut up cut out your operating expense, like get some of your shipments done and stop dicking around Talking and stop tweeting company. good morning. Yeah, oh my god. And dude, fuck them. I got uh, can't help TC on me. It's literally it's literally like it's literally like if you had just done a few things differently, like you can be a billion dollar company. You just don't like stop tweeting good morning at me. Like I don't care. I don't want you to say good morning I got to me. I want you to, to get some contracts. On Twitter. I don't need you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't need you to spend, uh, you know, op your already heavily op operating expense on a uh, good morning. Hey, man, tweets. it's better than them bitching about shorts on Twitter. I feel like that was the worst. What oh, CEO that would be did that? worst. Like, oh, fuck the shorts. <laughs> uh, I mean, you had uh, what was it, AHT or whatever? Yeah. Damn. That guy was uh, nuts. All right, fellas. Well, uh, it's been a blast. Hope you guys enjoy it, and we will see you Sunday. And uh, let's hope for the best for the the retail reversal, huh? All right, yeah, boys. Baby. Love y'all.